Balake. Where is Balake at? My name is Blake. Do you want to go to war, Balake? I'm for real. A.A. Ron. Oh, I got it all screwed up here. <laughs> there it is. Uh, welcome back for some more uh, SPTV, where uh, every day is a good day not to be in a cult. Um, I have what I think is a really amazing uh, surprise for everyone. This is an interview I'm really looking forward to doing. Um, guys, I've, ha I've done a few interviews already with people familiar with the California's criminal justice system to give us some idea of what Danny Masterson is about to walk into. The first interview I did was with my lawyer friend, Zach. The second interview I did was with my, um, uh, my, my, poli my former police chief friend, John Poe. The third interview that I did was with my good friend, Nasty Nathaniel. Nasty Nathaniel did spend time in California's prison system, but up to a level two facility. Uh, I was then contacted by several people who spent time in level three and level four facilities that said, Danny's about to experience something a, a whole lot different than what you've heard about so far. Uh, one of those people is Tommy Scoville. Tommy Scoville um, did time in California's prison system for robbing, in his words, robbing a whole lot of banks. And he's going to tell us a, a little bit about that. So um, let me bring, uh, let me bring Tommy on here, you guys. Tommy, thanks for joining me. Yeah, I'm happy to be here and appreciate you. Uh, let me show everyone real quick your YouTube channel called The Life Boat. Um, what is your channel about? Uh, well, when I got out of, uh, uh, when I went to prison the last time, I went three times in my life. I was addicted to heroin and uh, I robbed banks to get money to pay for a, a drug habit. And when I went the last time, I got sober and really took advantage of the time that I was there, sort of turned my life around. And when I got out of prison, my brother and I are kind of well known because of the ability to eat really hot peppers. It's a kind of a... <laughs> A dubious way to be well known, but I uh, I wanted to uh, go in a different direction. So what it is is twice a day we do basically a sobriety uh, meeting, for lack of a better way to put it. And uh, by the way, um, since, people... since you mentioned it real quick, I'm just showing your brother's YouTube channel. He's got quite a, quite a sizable channel called Chase the Heat. You guys could be twins, but I'm guessing he's <laughs> he's a few years older than you. I'm considerably better looking than him, but uh, <laughs> I can see the resemblance. All right, so you're Tommy, he's Johnny. That's his channel is Chase the Heat. Your channel is The Life Boat. Is this dedicated to um, uh, recovery, like substance abuse recovery? Absolutely, 100%. That is what our channel does. It is not a 12-step program. It's uh, We don't go that route, but it is a sobriety channel. So 5 a.m. and 5 p.m. on the uh, Pacific uh, Standard Time, we do a, uh, a one-hour live feed gives people an opportunity to meet other people in sobriety and uh, set up a support group of people that don't get high. And so far the uh, it's really been a, uh, a landslide. We, the, our numbers are incredible, probably awesome. a little better than Narconon. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which we were talking, you know, we were talking uh, just privately yesterday and, and you asked me, I won't say their names just for privacy purposes, unless you want to, you said, do you happen to know? And you named two people who, when my wife and I were still in Scientology, were two of our closest friends. And, uh, you know, they're both OT8s now. And the fact that these worlds <laughs> have this overlap is really weird because these are two people that you knew quite well. Yeah. Um, so how, how many years did you spend in the California prison system and also well, the, federal, it, the federal system? Yeah, I was, in the, I was in the federal system, but I was in the federal system in California. So there's a bit of a distinction, but... I did time in the feds in probably six states. But when you cross into California, all of a sudden, it's like you're no longer in the feds. The time you do in California, especially if you happen to be white, is a completely different uh, setup altogether. The California uh, car in the federal system runs their uh, their yards very similar to the, uh, the state facility. And Danny is not... He's not going into a uh, fun situation. You know, a lot of people hear uh, that someone like Danny will be in um, protective custody or sensitive oh. need yards. And I think it's easier for people to assume that means Danny is safe. Uh, you explained an awful lot to me yesterday. I, I hope we have the opportunity to cover all that ground here. And by the way, we're doing this as a live interview. We're going to do this as a Q&A. Feel free to ask questions and I'll bring them up as appropriate and as time allows. <clears throat> yeah, so basically, when people hear PC, right, protective custody, 
um, you tend to, to think that they're going to be in this nice little cush place where there's a bunch of people watching them. And what people don't realize is if you happen to be what they call an SO, right, which is what he's just got convicted of. A sex um, offender, right? Correct. It's the second rung on the ladder, right? The lowest being doing that to a child. The, the next rung up is where uh, he is at. So he's basically considered the scum of the earth. He gets sent to a PC yard, but there are killers on those yards. For instance, let's say you are a lieutenant in a gang. You're a high up. You've put in work. You've got bodies. You know, you've literally killed people. And then all of a sudden there's a beef with you and the guy at the top and over whatever money, dope. But they kick you out of your particular gang. You're going to a special needs yard. So everybody that doesn't make the cut in the gangs end up on these yards. They, the days of, uh, you know, I heard in one of the interviews you did, and they were all good. They just, you know, I have a slightly different take, I think. But in one of the interviews, the guy was talking about how all of these people who look at child porn have basically flooded the California system. There's nobody in the California system that looked at child porn. That's a federal offense. So if you go online and you look at, at uh, any of that stuff, you're going to the feds. There is not a state that, that has been completely handed over lock, stock and barrel to the federal government. And the, the reason being primarily because people do it online. So it crosses all state lines and whatever. But the California system is notoriously vicious. And my, my experience when I was in the feds, we saw a lot of famous people come through, you know, the, uh, the cop that, um, that made one of his wives disappear. And then they exhumed the other one. His name was Drew Peterson. He was a cop from Chicago, Illinois. They pulled him out of the state system because he was in jail with people he put in jail. I'm not a great setup. So they put him in the feds and that cat walked to normal yards, but there wasn't a day that went by that he didn't get beat on. I mean, not a day. And it, they continued to do it basically until uh, they had to remove him from the federal system and put him back into a different state where they're not telling anybody exactly where it's like witness relocation for a convict almost. But my experience is this, Aaron, he's going to be paying rent when he gets to a yard, depending on who the shot caller is, because each yard has somebody that's running that particular yard, right? They do answer to somebody above them, but anything that happens on that yard, that's their uh, opportunity to call the shots. They may just decide to hit him instantly you know, we don't want him on this yard, whatever. The, the other option is people are going to go up to him and say, here's the way it is. If you want to stay here, you're going to be paying rent to him, 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 and me. And that's not done in stamps. That's people that say, I'm going to give you my girlfriend or my wife's information and your people are going to send money street to street or we're going to take you out. And it's one of those unique situations where you can't go tell them. I mean, if, if you go tell the next place you go, you know, you're going to get whacked before you even get a chance. You know, they don't put up very uh, kindly to people who, um, who tell, especially once they're inside the system. But the PC thing, uh, it's not what people think it is. There are a ton of gang dropouts. I mean, a ton. Every single day, there are more people in the system that get into a beef with their fellow gang members and now they need to go to one of those yards. Those yards are filled with killers. That's the truth. So could someone like Danny <clears throat> get in there and go, okay, my best shot at having protection in here is to join a gang? Well, no, he has absolutely no uh, chance whatsoever to join a gang. There are no, you know, SO um, gangs. If you're a sex offender, there's no uh, gang anywhere that's taking you. I mean, at all. There's no chance of that. What he can do, I mean, the probably the, and it's kind of funny because he's a Scientologist, because there are people who go in and say, I'm going to ride with, um, you know, Muslims. I'm going to be with them and that's it. That's my car. And you hang out with them and nobody but them and you can't eat it at the table with your normal uh, car and all of that stuff. But seeing as he's, um, you know, a Scientologist, I don't see him going and becoming part of the Muslim Brotherhood. So uh, I don't see any way out for him other than paying rent and they will just bleed his family dry. They're going to put it, uh, get to a point where his loved ones are going to have to make a decision. Do we continue to pay these people? Right. Do we risk calling the cops? Because if, you know, 
If they call up and say, this is the person I'm sending the money to on the street. I mean, that's a death sentence. I promise you bad things would happen on the inside. They will bleed that guy dry. I mean, I watched it happen in the federal system constantly. You know, there were some really high profile people that went to the feds. And if you've got cash, I remember sitting in on a yard and uh, people were talking about TI, you know, the, uh, the, mm. the, and everyone was going, good Lord, send them to this yard. You know what I mean? Send them to this yard. Now we wouldn't have been able to do anything because he's not in our car, right? He's a different race. What does but, car mean? What does car mean? Um, the white car, right? That would be everybody that is a solid white boy. But what so, does car, what does car mean though? It just, it is a, a term that is used behind the wall that basically just means one of two things, everybody from where you're from. So if you're on a very big yard, the, uh, the Salt Lake car might hang out in one table. And then you've got the Vegas car that might hang out at another table. It is just the people that you run with on a daily basis. However, the bigger car is you are a white guy. And if the ship ever hits the sand, they expect you to be there for, uh, for the cause. Now, that's whether you believe in any of the, their politics or any of that, you got to be ready to go. Key point that I hadn't hear anybody else talk about. When you get to a real yard, like a level four yard, you get to that yard instantly. As soon as you walk in the door, we need to see your paperwork. And they're going to back it up anyway. They're going to get the paperwork. They're going to look at it. Then they're going to go get on a phone and they're going to do Pacer. And they're going to call up somebody and they're going to run them through an app called Pacer, which is not just going to cover the crime that they're on, but it's going to cover every crime in every state they've ever had anything to do with. And if any of it's dirty, then that person is not going to be staying on that yard. And very often they're either going to leave with the crap kicked out of them, hitting the head with a lock and a sock or stabbed. I mean, these well, are Tommy, violent. Tommy, Good. why, why are they doing that? Why are they looking into the background of people who come in to make sure um, that they want them on the yard? Okay. So let's say you go, let's say your, uh, your crime brings you 25 years. You are stuck in a city this big for 25 years. And you're looking around nine out of 10 times. The reason you're in there is because somebody else testified against you, right? Somebody rolled almost in every case. There is somebody that told on you. So you don't want to be on a yard with somebody that screwed over that guy or that guy, because if they did it to one person, I guarantee you they'll do it to another. They don't want rats on the yard. And more importantly, they do not want sex offenders of any kind on the yard because they're bad people. You know what I mean? Here's, here's the thing, Aaron. Let's say you snapped and you killed somebody. It's a, it's a horrendous thing to do, but the average human being can go, I can see that. The guy came home and he caught his wife with a, a younger guy and he freaked out and he killed him or whatever. It doesn't make sense. It's a bad idea, but it makes sense to me. You happen to have the, uh, a part on a hit TV show, Right. You got all kinds of money. You own your own nightclub. Everything in life is perfect and you need to drug girls in order to, uh, to have your way with them. There is nobody on any yard that's going to go, okay, yeah, I can see that, right? That makes sense. It doesn't make sense to anybody. And if you're going to be stuck there, and, I, and to be really honest, I think a lot of it too is just that this is their life. You become very, very bored, you know, and that whole, they call it politics. The term politics in prison means Honestly, about how racist the yard is and how much they push the line on things like white boys have to do mandatory workouts or your cell has to, your mattress has to be rolled up during the day because they don't want anybody napping in case there's a riot. They want to make sure everybody is there and ready to go. It's really kind of barbaric stuff. You know, it really is. But that's the world he's going into. So after that paperwork gets checked, right, when the person uh, shows up on that yard and their paperwork is checked, Let's say the paperwork is good. Now they're the, uh, you know, their life starts and they're going to, where are you from? You know, this car is this, go ahead. What does good paperwork mean? So good paperwork would be um, your crime. It could even be murder. There's nothing wrong with the, it, as long as you didn't harm a, uh, a child, as long as you were not a sex offender, right? Those two. And if you ratted on your case, Right. Mm -hmm. In the federal system, it's called a 5K, right? A 5K1. So when you come in with your paperwork, we're turning to page four to see if it says 5K1. That means that you cooperated with the authorities and got a lesser sentence. 
does not make anybody happy. You know, that's a rat and they don't like rats in the, uh, in the system. So they do everything they can to make sure that those people are gone. The, the crazy thing is that even if he's going to a, uh, a special needs yard, the, the gang dropouts on that yard, they're not going to be real happy to have a high profile sex offender on their yard. And everybody, but everybody is going to want to be the guy that got him. Do you remember Jared from Subway? Mm -hmm. Okay. I was in the federal system when Jared from Subway came in. Now he was not on the yard I was on because he was sent to a special needs yard, but that guy got the, his first beat down happened at Oklahoma at Con Air. He wasn't even in the prison system yet and he had already gotten beat up and they were shipping him all over the country because everybody wants to get out of prison and say, I punched that dude out. I knocked him smooth unconscious. You know, Danny is going to be a high profile person that everybody wants to hurt. You mentioned to me yesterday, this concept of putting in the work and yes. what does that mean? And what does that mean for Danny? Okay. Well, Danny is not going to be asked to put in work because he's a sex offender. He is going to be the work. So you show up on the yard and let's say I'm your rep. Rep is just a guy that takes care of the unit. On the yard, there might be eight units. Each unit has a rep, right? It's like a hierarchy. So I go to you and I say, all right, let me see your paperwork. All right, the paperwork is good. You are third on the list to put work in. And if you do not put in work, you cannot be on this yard. They sometimes call it a gut check or a heart check. They want to know you're willing to fight. They want to know that you're willing to hurt somebody for the cause and that you will follow instructions. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. And, you know, they say you're third on the list. If somebody turns out to be a rat, the first on the list is going to go put work in. And the shot caller is going to say, we're going to send two dudes to watch to make sure nothing bad happens to you. And uh, we want him stabbed or we just want him beat up. You could take a lock and a sock, go to work, but it needs to be. And if the kid does a good job, he gets a tattoo. Usually they, he gets a tattoo that says, you know, he put work in and whatever, yada, yada. It's, it doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense, but on any level four yard, you're not walking that yard if you don't put in work. And he's going to be the work. They're going to say to somebody, hey, Danny Masterson's on this yard, right? You're, you're next up. We want you to go get this guy off the yard. And you said the other day, if he, if he does everything right, he could get good time. And, you know, let me tell you something. If somebody jumps him and beats the crap out of him, they're going to call that a fist fight for both of them. It doesn't, it doesn't, they don't differentiate the, oh, you know, mutual combat and all of that stuff. He's just going to be, he's going to be running every single day for basically the entire time he's in there. It's not going to work out well for the cat. It's incredible. I mean, it's incredible. It's incredible to think about this entire, this entire uh, culture that exists. And Danny, after a life of privilege and um, smug expectations that he has for how he should be treated, he is now the lowest of the low with nowhere to hide. The now, lowest of the low in a place where everybody is already low. You know what I mean? The uh, what percentage of the uh, of America is going to end up in a prison, and then to end up in that prison as a sex offender and a famous one? One of the coolest things. Some one of the people that you interviewed the other day said, from walking a red carpet to walking that first walk. When he gets in there the first time, and they give him his bedroll and his footlocker and all that, and he's got to walk, and he's going to hear people you know, yelling really foul stuff about him having a pretty mouth and uh, <laughs> all kinds of just horrendous things meant to terrorize him. And that moment of reality for him is going to be, I can't tell you how nasty it's going to be. I've watched some hard dudes go into level four yards and look shook up. And I don't get the impression that Danny is a particularly hard dude. So you, you said a couple of things to me yesterday on, regarding the idea of COs uh, having a job or doing their job of protecting inmates. There's one particular story you told me of, yeah. of a, a guy. <laughs> oh, well, there's two. There's two. But the, the, the lesser one for now is the CO walking the new guy in and announcing to the entire cell block. Yeah. Amber, Amber alert. alert. This was the federal system. And if the guy had a uh... – a child porn charge or anything that involved a kid, 
when he would walk him through the front door, he would start screaming at the top of his lungs, Amber Alert, Amber Alert. I mean, that, there are a lot of um, there are a lot of officers that I mean, no one likes a sex offender, right? No one likes a sex offender. These these people take advantage of, uh, of individuals in a way that you can't respect at any level. It just it brings on hate. And if you're in a if you're in an environment where you got nothing to do all day long but make weapons, right? Literally, I mean, everybody, the yards I was on, there was nobody that didn't have a piece. You know, in fact, I remember going and getting my clothing at Victorville, and the uh, guy handing me my stuff went and put one between the pants and said, "You know, you need to keep this on you." And I just went, "Oh Lord, man, you know that's just great." Because which, which different facilities were you in in California? Um, well, I was in, uh, um, Victorville was the, uh, the California yard that I was at and I was at the penitentiary and I was also at the FCI, right? The federal penitentiary is the, um, they call it Victimville. It is an ugly, ugly facility. And my points dropped. I did enough time at the USP that my points dropped. And once my points dropped, they kicked me directly across the street. I got all excited you know, the concept was I was going to get to go to a federal corrections institution, which is a much softer facility. In theory, it's a much softer uh, facility. And that's why you keep your nose clean. And that's why you try not to fail drug tests and, and try not to get in fights, because you want to get to yards that you have a little bit more freedom on. The level four yards are locked down all the time. Somebody gets stabbed, everybody has to lock down, right? You come off lockdown, somebody stabs to get back at them, you're on lockdown. There were there were stretches where in the course of nine months, you might've been out 10 days, just ugly. But me thinking I'm all happy packing up my clothes, thinking maybe I'm going to get to go to one of these 120 yards somewhere in a nice part of the country. And they literally put me in a van and drive me across the street <laughs> to, uh, to Victorville FCI, which when I got to it was worse than the USB. It really was the, uh, there was a guy that cut the warden, um, while I was there, we ended up on a lockdown for about uh, three or four months behind that, but cut him through a three piece suit, took like 70 staples, really, really ugly. The, uh, the, the level of hate, you know, when he, when he steps foot onto this yard, I'm telling you, I, it's going to sound really sick and twisted, but there's not much I wouldn't do to see the look on his face when the reality sinks in. You know what I mean? He's, he's going to be, I think in my opinion, you know, you have a better chance of getting protected in a county jail. Once you get to a prison yard, right? A county jail is like, you're just, you're moving your way through. There are people who are going to live on the yard he gets put on for the rest of their life. That's their home. That's their city. That's, it's frightening, right? But that's the truth. You get a 55 year sentence. It, this is, uh, this is his home. Trust me, that cat ain't getting out of jail. Because what's going to happen is, I promise you, you're going to see a lot more cases start coming out. And, you know, you were asking the other day, do you think that they'll bring charges? They will bring charges. They're going to bring charges. Because, number one, it's justice for the, for the victims. They have a right to, to see him get punished for. And the other thing, you know, for what he did. And the other thing is, God forbid they overturn a sentence. Right? They throw out one of them. And 15 years later, he's able to walk you know, out the front door because one got overturned on appeal and they had a chance to charge him on four other crimes that they didn't, no chance in hell. They're going to charge him for every one of those things. Right. You're talking, you're talking about whether prosecutors would, even though he's already in prison, prosecute him for new victims that come forward. You're saying, hell yes, they will. Oh yeah, they're going to, I promise you they're going to. You know, Why we, is it, you mentioned, you mentioned earlier that it, uh, the only chance he would have to join either a gang or a group that might provide protection um, is to convert to Islam. Why is that? Because that's the only religion um, that I saw in the prison system that would take anybody in because their philosophy is anything you did before you handed your life over to, uh, to Allah, that's all in the past and it's all forgiven and it's all forgotten. So you see a lot of guys come in the front door and instantly start screaming, where, where are the, where's the, you know, the Muslim car, but that's instant, you know, that from that point on, that's where you eat. That's where you hang out. Those are the people that you can live with. It really is going to change how you do your time. But as high profile as he is, as a, as a Scientologist, I don't see him um, <laughs> joining up with the, uh, with the Muslim folks. 
Uh, you might have just answered a question I was I was going to ask, which is, if celebrities are such high targets and if sex offenders are such high targets, how did someone like Mike Tyson make it through his time? Is it because he converted to Islam inside? Um, well, the other thing is this. Um, in different states and in, for different races, there are there is a different philosophy about sex offenders within different races. And I'm not trying to get political and, and bust on anybody or anything else. But um, California white boys are probably the most savage people in the entire world when it comes to taking care of sex offenders. He picked the wrong state to be a white sex offender in. You know, that it's just they really run a tight line. They, uh, and Mike Tyson is, uh, is probably a little bit better equipped to take care of himself. Right. If I had to fight one of the two of them, I think I'd like to fight two Dannys <laughs> before I would, you know, take on Mr. Mr. Tyson. Wow. So I, I, I'm assuming it's going to come as a surprise to others just because it came as such a surprise to me that even the Aryan nation gang in the prisons wouldn't even consider letting Danny join them for protection. Is that what you're saying? There's no prison gang on the planet that is going to take that man in. The sex sex offenders it's it's called nc status you heard that before nc Means status you got nothing coming right mm. you got nothing coming when he comes walking out and he's got his pillow and his bedroll and all of that if he gets to his cell with his pillow i'll be shocked there are going to be people that just treat that dude like a doormat and do whatever they want he gets on the phone to go call his wife people will walk up hang up the phone and go beat it and you're on NC status, you got nothing coming, right? Nothing, that's just how it works. So I got sent, the last prison that I went to was in uh, Oregon, Sheridan, Oregon. And it is, they call it Sheridice, right? Because it is as close to, uh, to freedom as you're gonna get in a, uh, in a federal prison. It is soft, I mean, really soft. But that was the first one that I had been on where they had sex offenders. And when you show up, they say to you, you know, there are guys here that have bad paperwork and they had them on one row, right? Like nine cells all in a row. Every single one of them was a, was a sex offender. And they warn you, I had four months left, right? I just had to do four months, but I ended my prison career by doing that four months. Like if I went back to the feds right now, I'd be in deep doo-doo for not taking one of those guys out on that yard. So would everybody else that I was there with. But interestingly, they ate standing up. They were not allowed to sit down. So three meals a day, these guys would stand up there with their trays. I mean, it is a, it is a rugged life. And I remember uh, talking to a guy and saying, you know, I don't like the idea that they're on the yard, but it does make the food taste a lot better when you see those guys standing up to eat it, you know? It's so just they're, they're made to eat three meals a day standing up. And is that just because... That's the price that you guys get to pay for the fact that we're not attacking you every day. Like, and yeah, but, I mean, but there, why did they there, skate? Did, why did, why were they able to skate at that? Is it because what was the it's reason? The custody level. It's the custody oh. level. The, what it comes down to is this, and not all of them skate. Like in the time that I was there, about eight or nine solid white guys came through, and what that means is, as soon as they found out those guys were there, they sprinted across the room and attacked one. You know, and you know, then they get shipped to another yard. And if you're going to be spending 25 years or 30 years in there, you need to keep your name solid as hell. I have a vested interest to never go back. But I got shipped to where I was, you know, as close to home as I could be. That was the closest yard. And the new law was they have to get you near home, like within 500 miles in the last six months of your sentence. So I didn't have a choice of where I was going. That was the yard. And I could have bucked got more time, got sent to a different place. I was like, yeah, no, man, I just want to get out, you know, live my life. By that point, I was about uh, five years sober and I had not had five years of sobriety in my life. You know, that was a, uh, a first. But By the way, how many years did you do total, if you don't mind my asking? Um, altogether, I've done uh, 13. 13 years. Yep. Um, you explained something to me yesterday about um, uh, the idea of, of green light of being greenlit and how yeah. it works with the gangs and, yeah. and, and sort of how, why it's so important to understand wow. that Danny's not going to have the protection of one of the gangs or the cars or whatever. Can you explain that? Sure. Let's say um, two people get into a beef, right? The, 
as opposed to just start swinging on each other and getting the unit locked down and having all kinds of problems, because when the unit gets locked down, they're going to bring in the goon squad and they're going to search every single cell, right? They're going to throw all your contraband out. It tends to really piss off the, the, uh, the white guys. You know what I'm saying? They don't like being, having their stuff interrupted. So the rep of the unit will talk to the shot caller. And if you and I got a beef, they'll say, all right, here's how it's going to work out. The two of you are going in that cell and you're going to fight, you know, and the, uh, the winner comes out, the loser still stays on the yard. We'll take care of him, whatever, but that's how you're going to settle your beef. There are people who make those decisions. Let's say you and I get into an argument and I'm a black guy. You're a white guy. Now we really got an issue, right? Because if you strike somebody from a different race, bad, bad things happen. So I would have to go to my shot caller. You would have to go to your shot caller. Those two get together. They have a discussion on what's going to happen. But if, if they give a green light, like let's say there are two uh, gangs that beef, right? They'll have a green light. What it means is, you see them, you attack them, and you try to kill them. On site, you're green-lighted. Um, SOs are green-lighted, right? They're always green-lighted. A solid white guy in, in the California system, if he gets a shot at hitting him and doesn't, he will end his career. You understand? Like from the, from the prison, I, you know, I am a convict kind of uh, mindset. If you got an opportunity to punch a sex offender, stomp him out, stab him, whatever, and you don't take advantage of that, the, um, they're going to take you off the yard. You're gone. It's a it's a pretty bizarre world that he's about to enter. I promise you, wow. it's it's a bizarre world. So once you explained all this to me yesterday, I said, you know, <clears throat> when you have a culture where not only is it permitted to attack or even kill someone like Danny, not not only is it just permitted, it's actually a problem if you don't. Right. I said, then how is it that there's any left in the system? How is it that any of them even continue to remain? And what, if any chance, does Danny even have to, con to survive in the system? What are, what he's got what are going his for him? What he has going for him is uh, cash. But let's use the federal system as an example because it's a much larger um, micro, you know, microcosm. You get on the yard, right? And they find out your paperwork is bad. They're going to beat the ever-loving crap out of you within, you know, a day of you being there. Then you're going to go to the hole where you're going to wait for about four months to see the disciplinary hearing officer for your fight. Now, they're going to say we're taking 120 days of good time or we're taking 60 days of good time credits or whatever. And so your sentence just got a little longer. And they say, and now we're shipping you to a different yard. That person waits in the hole for probably eight to nine months to catch the train to the next spot. When they get to the next spot, the same thing is going to happen. There are guys in the federal system that do their entire sentence exactly like that. One ass kicking after another and then ship to a new yard. Get to the new yard, get beat within an inch of your life, go to the hole, wait for the disciplinary hearing officer. And it's just, you know, rinse and repeat. The reason that a lot of these people are not gone is because um, when you go to the shoe, you're protected. They're not going to stick anybody in the uh, – when you go to the shoe, if you have really rotten paperwork, the only person they would ever put in that cell with you is somebody that has really rotten paperwork. So anybody that Danny becomes a homeboy with for the rest of his time on this planet probably did something really foul to a, uh, a woman or a child. He's never going to have anybody that he lives with that isn't a freak. Now, you mentioned um, some of these gangs might, well, you mentioned cash is what he has going for him, that they might literally sell him. Like there are people who will be willing to protect him for a fee. That's, so that's different than letting you join, than, than, that's different than a gang letting you join the gang. A gang will protect you for a fee, but they don't consider you a member. How does that work? Yeah, you're not a member in any way, shape, or form. What you're doing is you're handing, it's just rent. You're handing enough money to the uh, powers that be, right? The top of the food chain in terms of the, of the gang on the yard. You're paying for the right to be there. Now, this happened at Victorville, right? And I doesn't suppose it matters, right? Because the guy's dead anyway. But the, the, the shot caller's name was Snow, S-N-O-W, right? And um, supposedly... I don't know if there's any truth to it, but supposedly he was letting people pay rent at Victorville. 
he knew that some people had some paperwork that was bad and then he was taking large chunks of cash to not out these people or what they call pulling your covers, right? That's the term in prison. He pulled his covers and he let everybody know everything, right? So they cut his head off and left him with two shanks in his eyes, the shot color. No joke. Like that's, that's one you can look up. That was uh, one of the most vicious. Uh, yeah. The, the, the level of um, the level of violence on a, uh, on a, a max or a super max yard is frightening. Like it really is. It's the kind of thing where I, I remember being in a shoe in a segregated housing unit, like people call the hole. And they brought a guy into our hallway because it goes off in three different hallways. And he knew somebody and the two of them started yelling back and forth. And he talked for two and a half hours describing how the reason he just got moved to our tears because he tortured somebody. He had a cellmate. They put him in with a sex offender. He tortured this guy and then killed him. And the story was so bizarre that I'm like, <laughs> the guy that I was with, we're laughing going, oh, come on, man. I mean, that's five hours of torture. There's no way. So the next day when we're going to wreck, I said to the cop, man, you guys brought that loud dude last night. I said, all he did all night was scream about how he had just tortured and killed somebody. He goes, oh boy, you should have seen the scene. I mean, this stuff happens. It happens Often. It happens all the time. And high profile. Now, here's the thing. They know if a high profile person gets whacked, they're, they're going to catch a lot more crap. So they may do what they can, but there's no way to completely isolate the guy. Right. There's even if you put them all to a sex offender yard, there's a hierarchy among those people. Right. The uh, I'm trying to remember how the uh, clickers. Right. Those are people who just look at pictures of kids. Right. The people that touch them. So even in the like at, at um, the prison I was at, there was a hierarchy. Like there were certain sex offenders that wouldn't hang out with that sex offender because that dude's a freak. Like, he, you know, he touched somebody. We were only looking at pictures. Bizarre. But if they put him on a yard where every single person there is a freak, they're still going to want to hit Nate Masterson. He's famous. The toughest guy in the room is going to try to extort him and it's going to work promise you this and so i know you you've sort of already addressed this but i just i, I keep I, I keep coming back to this question because i feel like a lot of other people might ask the question how is someone in a system like this how is jared fogel for example still alive well like i said so you hit a yard you're there not even four hours if you're jared fogel they're going to attack you as soon as you get there or the other great example is the guy that um kidnapped elizabeth smart I was going through Oklahoma City when I watched a guy punch that dude in the head. And he's only about four foot six anyway. He's not a very big guy. But I saw somebody hit him in the head hard enough to knock down the uh, metal detector. You know, the, he took down everything. It was, a, it was a pretty good shot. But so you hit somebody, right? Jared Fogel goes down. He goes to the hole. Four months waiting to see a disciplinary hearing officer. Eight months waiting to get shipped to the next yard. That's a year. You hit the next yard. He hits you, right? Four months waiting for the disciplinary hearing officer, eight months going to the, uh, to the next yard. And they can say, I want protective custody. When they get to a prison, they can say, I'm not going out on that yard. Like I remember that when I went to the USP at Victorville, 38 of us went in on a bus. Seven of us walked out onto the yard. Because everybody else there was like, I ain't going out there, man. There, there's something in my jacket or there's something from my past or, you know, I'm just plain scared or whatever it is. But, you know, the vast majority of people wanted nothing to do with that yard. And as crazy as this is going to sound, if you got to do time, the higher the custody level, the more the respect. So different races never seem to, to you know, it doesn't go bad until it goes bad. Everybody lives harmoniously. You stay with your own. There's not a lot of people talking back and forth between other races and whatever, but th there was nobody, nobody's going to steal anything from you. And nobody's ever going to, you know, there's no disrespect at all. You, there's no place on the planet where you will hear, excuse me more than in a, on a level four year. Excuse me. No, no, excuse me. You know, everybody wants to, yeah. You know, you show a level of respect to every single person in there because you know, that if that person's on a level four yard, they either had a really twisted crime, right? They did something heavy or they're a psycho, a stone cold killer, because there are guys that come into prison with really low yard points. And what that means is when you first show up, they're going to assess a number for you. 
right? They put you in, in the joint, we call it the fish tank. But what it is, is intake, right? So you go to an intake unit and then you're going to do a medical, uh, you're going to do a psych, you're going to see all of these different people. And what they're trying to do in the two months that they have you locked down is see if you can do time, right? They're not going to let you get out of the cell very much. In fact, they're going to do everything they can to keep you locked down almost 24 hours a day. And the people who can't take it tend to go nuts. Then they can take those people and ship them off somewhere else. Give me five seconds to replace this battery. <laughs> okay, then. You know, I would answer questions if I could see it. Oddly enough, I can't pull up the, um, the chat. But then again. Bada bang. A fast little uh, pissed off. Um, okay. That was pretty cool. Okay, so you mentioned earlier, I just wanted to uh, bring this back up, this whole idea of people on the inside saying you are going to have your wife deliver this amount of money to my wife, my girlfriend, my friend, whatever. So like Danny's family will be involved in paying bribes to the – Friends yeah. of the people inside who may have agreed to protect Danny. And that money is the only money or this whole, you know, spending 12 months in confinement every time he gets his ass beat yeah. is pretty much going to be the only thing that saves him. Now, now his family, I got to tell you, I mean, I don't know. I see. It's hard for me to imagine a family of, of diehard Scientologists agreeing to something like that. I think they, they might have a private chat with Danny and be like, Danny, you don't, don't put us through this. You know what to do. You know what to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and that's, that's a very interesting thought, right? And when we were talking yesterday, this, this was something that stuck with me for like two or three hours after our conversation. If, you know, if you're really, you know, drink the Kool-Aid and you really buy into absolutely everything, if he's a, if he's a diehard believer, then how important is this body anyway? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, the, uh, yeah, I would not be surprised if uh, if that happens, if, if he decides to uh, to take himself out. Um, people will, the, as far as the street to street goes, you know, if you're if you got a habit in prison, if you're doing, you know, a thousand dollars worth of heroin a week, you're not buying that with po with postage stamps. You know, behind the wall, there has to be some kind of currency. There has to be some fiat currency, something that represents money. And they use stamps. So you got 50 like, cents. Like just stamps. literal stamps? Yeah, because they can't stop you from buying $10 worth of stamps. Oh. They have value of 50 cents each. And it would get so confusing because when you buy it, as soon as you walk out of the store, it's worth $2 less than and you bought it for. It. And if you tear them up, but you have the same number, that's called a yard book. It drops two more dollars in value. It's bizarre. But the big money transactions are done street to street. And it's usually done through things like Green Dot or these cards that you can get. So his family's never going to have to meet anybody, but they're going to have to get on a telephone and say, all right, we just sent over, you know, 600 bucks. And the amount that he has to pay is going to just get bigger and more frequent and bigger and more frequent and bigger because the guys that are, are going to be taxing him, they're going to be taxing him for dope. You know, so if Danny's inside, if Danny's inside and he wants to, cause Danny, as a Scientologist, I know he's got these horrible um, criminal uh, predisposition that you know he's going to prison for but but he i don't <laughs> think he does drugs but if i were danny and i was on the inside and i didn't know how to live with my new reality i could very easily see danny um using substances to live in an alternate reality so if he if danny needs to buy substances from bubba and bubba says that'll be a thousand bucks danny Danny doesn't come up with a thousand bucks. Danny has someone on the outside. That's what you mean when you say street to street. He has someone Correct. on the street, pay someone else on the street. Yeah. And then somehow that goes back to the other guy, back to Bubba. Yeah. Bubba gets a, gets a, he makes a phone call and they say, yeah, I, I got the money. There are guys who go to prison and make 200 grand while they're in there. You know, they've got, they have somebody that's bringing them in dope. They're slinging the dope and street to street, not prison to street or street to prison. And they build up a very large nest egg. But to, to what you were just saying, what would happen is he'd send a thousand dollars on the street and then he'd come up and say, Hey, you know, you got that dope. And the guy would be like, now nah, you're the dope, right? Appreciate you. Good looking out on that thousand. 
You know, you, you ain't getting nothing. They literally got nothing coming. The guy that sells him drugs would be in trouble. You know oh, what I mean? He's, he's on NC status. Like, no joke, he's got nothing coming. It's not going to be a pleasant time for the guy. It really isn't. So in Which addition is, to looking to hurt him, they'd be looking to rip him off any way they can. And it depends on who the shot caller is because there are there are dyed in the wool like hardcore convicts that would say, you don't let a guy like that pay rent. No, you don't let a guy like that pay rent. You know, we, we smash him, we get him off the yard and we send him. Eventually he's going to hit someplace where the shot caller is willing to take a bunch of his money. But he could theoretically get shipped from one prison to another a lot. They call it diesel therapy. So, <laughs> you know, you, okay, somehow it just finally clicked. Getting someone off the yard means hurting them so bad they get sent to another prison. Correct. Oh, I don't know how that that didn't quite I'm sorry. you know that what? didn't quite set in before. <laughs> well, and, and it took me a long time watching you to get the uh, the Scientology lingo down, and I guess I take it for granted. And I, you know, I've been out a while, but the uh, some of the phrase, phraseology, yeah, getting someone off the yard. Um, there are basically two ways you can get off a yard. One is you put in for a transfer and they accept it. Your points dropped, whatever. The other way is. You know, a dishonorable way to leave the yard. You know, you uh, you check in. That means you go up and say, I need I You got to protect me. That's called checking in. And in the federal system, if you check in once, you're done. You can't go, oh, it was a mistake. I'm never going to do that again. You know, you got to guys got to give me a second chance. It doesn't work like that. If you ever ask for protective custody, you're done for the rest of your time. Wow. It's, it's, but if you get your ass kicked. And you didn't tell, you didn't do anything. That's an honorable thing. There's nothing wrong with losing a fight, right? They, they don't view the loser of a fist fight as, uh, as somebody that, you know, deserves any kind of derision. It's, you know, there's always a winner and a loser. Usually, like in the federal system, we would get that guy into a cell and take care of him until all the bruising went away. That means we got to cook for him because he can't go to the chow hall. And we got to keep him hidden so that the cops don't get a real good look at his eye you know, or his, uh, his face or whatever. Sometimes people have to get stitches and all kinds of other stuff that try to fly under the radar. Something it's tells me that Danny's, again. something tells me that Danny's first instinct is going to be to go and check in. Cause. Oh yeah. I would imagine, I, I don't think he's, uh, I don't think he's going to try to man up. I, I'd be really surprised if he does. Um, but one way or the other, you know, eventually he's going to get to a point where they say, no, you're going out to this yard. You know, I mean, I, I can't imagine they'd let him do 50 years. And I promise you, I would be willing to bet you my watch collection that this boy is about to pick up more time. Right. Guaranteed. To see, he's not done. You know, if he gets another one, isn't that a third straight, Cali? I think it is. He's got oh, yeah. two right now, doesn't he? Yep. One more. Is yeah, if they can get him for one more, he's doing life anyway. Oh, one other thing. Uh, actually, two other things. Um, the gamma hydroxybutyrate right? Or gamma hydroxybutyric acid. That's what that uh, low life was using apparently to knock people out. The term roofie tends to get, um, it's used ubiquitously like uh, Kleenexes, right? Doesn't have to be a Kleenex. We all call it Kleenex or a Xerox copy, but roofies have been gone for a real long time. They're very difficult to get in the US. What he was using was GHB, a bathtub version of it. That stuff was invented in 1920 to knock people out for surgery. There is no use for that stuff that's legit. Um, yeah, he's just, he's an absolute low life. And, and during the time that he was doing this, there was a floor stripper that was readily available on the internet. You could buy it. And some wise chemist figured out that a very simple recipe with that floor stripper and three other ingredients, and you could make gamma hydroxybutyrate. And it was virtually everywhere. You know, hmm. it's uh, ugly substance, really, really ugly substance. Uh, and the other thing was this. People have speculated that if he does X number of years and he's over the age of 50 or he's over the age of 60, that they're going to reduce. That doesn't happen with sex offenders. Right. Any of those cool programs, whether, you know, in the, in the feds or the states, any of those cool programs will never apply to him. Their, their biggest fear is that they're going to let a sex offender out and he's going to go and reoffend, and the, the politicians are all going to not get elected. He, 
you know, violent offenders, I don't know. But sex offenders, no, they got nothing coming. You're not getting that, you know, the good time credits. You're not getting any of that stuff. Right, right, right. Um, on the subject of COs, the correctional officers, um, being complicit in harming people like Danny. What was the story you told me about the Con Air thing that you were involved? You saw it. Yeah, the, the um, that was the that was the cat that um, that hit um, the guy that kidnapped uh, Elizabeth Smart. All of us wanted to hit this guy, but we when you get off the plane, you're in an airport, just like you would any other plane, right? The thing comes out to the side of the plane, and you walk down your gangplank, except you got cuffs and you're shuffling. And you're instantly in a prison. It's a high rise and they're doing the intake for everybody. And, you know, everyone's looking at this guy, like every single person in the building is looking at this guy and maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you know, went by. And finally one guy just runs, I mean, a dead sprint and punches this dude. And it's not like regular fights in prison. You want to hit somebody as many times as you can before you get tackled. So it usually looks like somebody saw in wood, right? I mean, they're just punching the crap out of them. But they had knocked down the metal detector. It was absolutely epic. But so he got taken to the hole and uh, he was out. The guy that he, that he hit, the, the, the rapist, was out for a good five minutes that I watched. And that's a really long time to be knocked out from a, from a punch. You know, normally it's just a, your lights go out and you wake right back up. But when I got on Con Air, the, uh, I remember how many days it was. But that cat came and sat down directly next to me, right? And I said to him, boy, you know what? I respect the hell out of you hitting that dude. I said, but they can charge you with a hate crime, right? Now, if you got life, who cares? But they can charge you with a hate crime if you go after an SO. It's crazy. It, it's a law that they tried to put into place because it is so rampant that people just attack them, that they're doing anything they can to try to keep them safer. And I said to him, but man, you ain't worried about catching a charge that could be six more years on your sentence and he said i swear to you he said the co told me you're in oklahoma brother he said whatever you do here i will bury that paperwork you're going to be on your next yard tomorrow i don't care what you do to this cat you ain't getting charged for it so he he let him have it the guy that i told you who yelled amber alert he uh he came in one day and said i got a uh, sand gene one battery radio Probably doesn't mean anything to anybody that's just listening to me, but anyone that's done time knows that a Sanjeev one battery radio is the, uh, you use less batteries, way less batteries. And that those earbuds are in your ears 24 hours a day. It's how you watch TV. It's how you do anything. So he said, I'm going to give it to the first person who takes this guy out. And he wasn't a sex offender, but he was a rat. He had apparently told on the cops like within the prison system, he told <laughs> that the cop had given cigarettes to some people or whatever. And uh, I actually got that sand gene. <laughs> I, I wanted that damn radio, man. I really oh my wanted God. that radio. But yeah, the so, COs, the COs are uh, no one. No one is really looking forward to protecting somebody that did that to a woman. It's just not. You know that's what, I mean? what that's what I thought was um, I mean, everything you've said has been very poignant. But the idea that even the COs do not want to be complicit in protecting someone like Danny Masterson. Oh, I yeah. think that's what people need to. Actually well, and they'll talk trash to them. I mean, they're they don't pretend to be friendly or anything else. You know what I mean? At least in the federal system. I mean, they would they would let people have it. You know, they uh, they're so close to. Um, and, I, and, and if you're listening to the sound of my voice and you're a CO, I apologize. But the difference between a convict and a CO is sometimes a hair. They, they have their code of ethics. We have our code of ethics. I watch two COs in the federal system take their stuff off, go into an office and beat the crap out of each other on shift while we all just look through the window like, damn, there's something you don't see every day, you know? But uh, yeah, I promise you, we're going to, I'll, I'll ring you up when the first news uh, hits because it's going to be fast. He's You're going to hear that something bad happened to Danny and you're going to hear it quickly. Yeah, because I know I've said in a few of my videos that I, people have told me he's even at more risk possibly during his uh, uh, temporary jail time than he is when he goes to prison. But you're like, no, 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 no. When he gets to he, prison, it's a different situation. Well, everybody in prison has a weapon. Right. I don't know. I've never been to the county jail that he's in, but I've been to a, a handful of county jails. 
And if you want to shave, they come by, they hand you a razor. Ten minutes later, they come back, they collect the razor, they check to make sure the blade's in it, everything else. When you're in, in, when you're in a, uh, a level four yard, you can buy a six-pack of razors at store, right? Those, those razors are in your cell. It's not particularly difficult to make a weapon, you know, and – we have the ability to make fire, all kinds of things that are a little bit tougher to do in uh, in a county jail, but it's a lot easier to do in prison. You know, if you have a battery, it's not that hard to, to make fire. And if you can make fire, you can make some pretty vicious weapons. Yeah, I just, I don't, uh, I don't envy the man, you know, but he's got it coming. Yeah. Wow. Okay. There's a few questions here that uh, you can help me with. Sure. Uh, Justin Craig AKA LRH 2.0. Okay. Is there a Scientology car in California prisons? I can't answer that. I can't answer that. The, uh, I never once ran into a Scientologist the entire time I was in the federal system, not one. And you, you know, because they call out, you know, the religious services. So they'll say, you know, all of the Muslims and then they'll come out. It's over a loudspeaker, all, you know, the Christians and the Baptists and the Catholics Satanists, you know, that gets called out. The uh, Asatru, you know, um, a lot of a lot of white boys are worshiping Odin, but I never heard Scientology get uh, get mentioned. Wow. All right, Ken's channel. Thanks, Tommy, for the insight. Are you related to Wilbur Scoville, creator of Scoville Pepper Heat Scale or Coincidence? Or is that so, not your real last name? <laughs> no, it is n neither, uh, neither my brother or I were born um, Scovilles. But the... Uh, we piggybacked off of Wilbur because of his, uh, his great scale. The, uh, when we started eating these things, people said that, you know, a Carolina Reaper would kill you, but there was not somebody that, you know, there wasn't even a possible thing. And, you know, I think I've seen my brother eat 46 of them at, the, at a sitting, you know, so we we just had a, a slightly different tolerance or, or I don't know, wow. ability to talk while we do it. It's silly. Really? Wow. <laughs> Denver Steve-O, there's something interesting about a guy who spoke a very specific and confusing cult language asking another guy from a different cultic language <laughs> to slow down and explain. <laughs> That's a great folks. comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, I guess the algorithm probably uh, won't know what this is talking about. Will, will Danny be holding someone's pocket? Will his stuff get pushed in? What does holding someone's pocket mean? <laughs> What it means is that, is he going to be the possession of somebody, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, you're, you're literally tethered to the dude. And, uh, and obviously, you know the other reference he made. This is the only chance that I see of that happening to him, right? It, the, there are two ways that could happen. One would be they put him in with a celly that is big enough to do whatever he wants. And at about 2 o'clock in the morning, he'll just do to him what you know, he did to other people. And that does happen. You know, it absolutely happens. Now, it can't happen to a solid person. If you did that to somebody in a solid individual with good paperwork, you're dead. You're literally going to be killed for that. But it's completely different. In fact, they have a very vile term for it. <laughs> they will allow that to be done to a, uh, a sex offender. The other option is if if he sends money and then eventually they say, that's it, we're not sending any more cash. They will literally sell them and they can sell them to a different race. They can sell them to whatever. And at that point, yeah, if you get sold, there will be some stuff getting, uh, getting pushed in. An apple and a sock is the uh, Victorville ball gag. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm skipping some of these comments, you guys. Uh, this is a family program. <laughs> Not really. Um, okay. Pat Short question. How do they find out if the paperwork is bad? Isn't that something only the guards have? Um. Say that one more time, the, the last part of it. Isn't that something only the guards have? Oh, no, 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 absolutely not. Um, when, you, uh, when you get there, um, you go and see your counselor. And the first thing your counselor does is print off. If they don't give you your entire case, which they should, they will give you your judgment of, of commitment. So that's enough. If somebody has done any time at all, I can look at a judgment of commitment and tell you if you're no good. Um, we can base it on what the, the charge is and how much time you got. You know, if you if you got a charge that like if Danny had, you know, got caught with cocaine, but he got four years and you go, wait a second, this carries 20 years. Why'd you get four? How many people did you tell on? And then number five on that judgment of commitment says, does this person have to register as a sex offender when they get out? 
And if that box is checked, they can't walk the yard. The other option is they go over to a phone and they call somebody on the street and they say, I need you to run this dude through Pacer. It's pretty easy to get someone's paperwork. It really is. Wow. Okay. Elizabeth Marino says, I grew up white and privileged in Los Angeles. Danny Masterson won't relate to anyone. Prison lingo is another language. He'll feel totally isolated. We'll stick out like a sore thumb. I'm an ex junkie too. All right. Hey, God bless you. Um, that's uh boy. I love hearing that. I really do. Um, yeah, I was on it for about three decades. It, it absolutely can be beat. It really can. But I have churched up the, uh, the prison lingo. Like I honestly, if, if, if it was a conversation between two inmates, you really have a tough time following it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because there, there is abbreviations and there's, you know, there's a, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Janet Cheney, curious about what happened to Cosby with all of this information then? Once again, um, Cosby had a ton of money uh, and he was in a kind of protective custody that no one else has ever been. He was unable to see when he went in and with no disrespect to any other race or any other car, they do not police their um, their car, right? Their community inside like the California white boys. And I've been in a lot of States and there is no place like the California white boys. Like he really, he could not have picked the worst spot to do what he did and get convicted. He could not have done any worse. I, I think that there's a chance maybe someday they dump him in the feds because he's just going to, there's no way that they can keep this dude safe. And sometimes they'll tap out and move him to uh you know, the uh, federal system and they've got ways of protecting people in the feds. If you're really super high profile, they got a place called the cheese factory uh, because it's full of high profile rats, but it can only handle about <laughs> 70 people. Isn't that funny? It's the cheese factory. The thing is Danny Masterson just isn't that high profile. I mean, he is. Oh, oh but he is to the fellas. Oh, I promise you, they're going like this right now. They're going to bring that, bring that dude here, man. Bring that dude here. Wow. All right. Calico two, six. What is visitation like? Can he still see his daughter? She's the only one of his family. I feel sorry for. Yeah. You know what? That's a, that's a really legit um, thing to say because you got to feel bad for the kids. You, you can have contact visits. Um, and usually they'll, they'll let you get, you know, a kiss when you first get there and a kiss when the person leaves. It's how a lot of stuff gets passed, you know, into the prison system. You kiss somebody, you swallow a balloon full of dope. Um, and then you take it back out whatever way that, uh, that you can, either the same way it went in or the other way. And that's how a lot of contraband gets there. But yes, he will have an opportunity to visit. Now that, if you get in trouble, if somebody beats him up and he gets sent to the special housing unit, he will not have contact visits. He will be able to see the family, but it'll be through glass and they'll be on a, on a phone. Once you're in the shoe, there are no contact visits. And, uh, I have a feeling that cat's going to spend a lot of time in the shoe. Wow. Uh, chicken head PK Neely, uh, as a retired CCO, uh, states have their own SO, oh, sex offender prisons. He may be transferred to another state for supervision. What's a CCO? Um, what does the C stand for? Because it's correction officer, but I don't know what the C stands for. Okay, so it might be a typo, perhaps. Okay. Or county, county corrections officer? California maybe. corrections officer, maybe. Perhaps. All right. Either way, we get the idea. Yeah. Okay, F.I. Crispin or <laughs> Fi Crispin or Fee Crispin. You want to see something hilarious? Ask Tommy if he likes Vegemite. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good to see you, Lady Fiona. Glad that do, you're here. Uh, do, you, do you like Vegemite, Tommy? Uh, you know, here's the thing. To... Um, I do ridiculous stunts to bring people into the lifeboat and uh, the uh, they've been trying to get, I, I can't do Vegemite. Like I've eaten, eaten some really foul stuff, the stroming and, you know, but Vegemite for whatever reason, just is really, really awful. And, and, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. boy. All right. Yeah. Roxanne wins says, what if someone takes a plea deal to drop an essay charge of a minor and only take the murder charge? Do people still know they are sex offenders like Raul Meza in Austin in 1982. Great question. 
So let me see if I get this right. Um, if he pled to the murder, they dropped the um, the sexual yeah. assault. Yeah, there's no way in hell they wouldn't know it. Mm. The uh, the nice thing about Pacer, right? The uh, the Pacer gives you an opportunity to see every single. So let's say we have a doubt. You come in and you hand us the paperwork, but you just something doesn't smell right, right? We'll say, all right, we need your docket sheet. And what that's going to do is it's going to put a list of every single time Danny showed up in court, what was done that day. So you're going to see on the docket sheet changed plea, you know, to this, the sexual assault dropped off. Oh, the boys are going to know, you know, there's a, and there's no getting away from it. These days, there's just no running and hiding. There really isn't. Wow. All right, Nancy Stitchin. Danny would do well to watch your videos on what he should expect in the upcoming days. Except he's already in jail. He ain't watching videos unless do yeah. they? Do they have any internet access? Any Netflix? Um, no, I don't see them. Uh, I don't see them getting now. He when he gets in there, he can have cable in his cell. Um, but it's basic cable, you know. He'll uh, he'll he'll probably catch his show on uh, on reruns if they still decide to show it. Yeah. Wow. All right. Ryan says, given all this info that he's so screwed, won't Danny be much more inclined to rat and turn on Scientology once he or his family sees this video? What would ratting on Scientology do for him at this point? Yeah, that's that's a legit question. It's not going to get him out of any trouble that he's in. You know, like he's... Uh, honestly, you, you know what would get that dude out of trouble? A bed sheet tied correctly. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's his... Uh, you know, if, if he is watching, that's your play, brother. You know, do the world a favor, lean in and take one for the team. Yikes. I mean, that, that, that opens up uh, an interesting line of conversation that you and I were having yesterday where I explained to you. Um, someone, someone very with a long history with the Masterson family explained to me, this person was in Scientology. I'm just not naming them just to be. The person probably wouldn't mind. But, and said, look, and this person was talking to me as, you know, we're both very seasoned former Scientologist. We, we, we talked the talk and we walked the walk. She said, even in Scientology, I've actually never met a family that was as militant and extreme with the um, always have to be at cause, always have to be at cause, always have to be at cause. Then the Masterson clan, they were just obsessed and infatuated with living at cause, being at cause, always being at cause. And that even Danny Masterson's best friend, Brighton Goss, um, had been diagnosed with like a, a degenerative heart condition and, and was dying and refused the heart transplant because he said he just couldn't manage to live with himself not being able to be at cause or live at cause now a normal scientologist would think that being at cause would just be getting the heart transplant and continuing to live right. but but the masterson clan would define being at cause as not having to forego any of the things you wanted to do so in other words this guy was like I couldn't live at cause not being able to have a drink, not being able to have a cigarette, which is what the doctors told him after you get a heart transplant, you can't drink, you can't smoke. And he says, well, that wouldn't be living at cause. I couldn't possibly continue to live without being at cause. The guy chose to die a, a slow, painful death of degenerative you know, heart failure than to simply get the heart transplant that would have saved his life, but he wouldn't have been able to live at cause. Now, a normal Scientologist in Danny's situation would define being at cause as figuring out how to actually survive through the duration of his sentence. That would be a normal Scientology definition of being at cause, how to continue to survive. Right. But this person explained to me that that's not how Danny defines being at cause, that even if Danny were to get out of prison today, Danny is screwed. Danny Masterson, the identity, the body, the person, the reputation, the name is destroyed irreparably and forever. And that Danny is the type of Scientologist who would be very likely to go, what's the point of continuing with this body, this mock-up, this identity, when this means nothing, this is temporary, I'd be better off just dropping this body, picking up a new body, growing up to be a child star all over again. <laughs> this person was basically explaining to me that she truly believes that Danny will just OD on something to drop the body. So he's, so he's definitely the real deal. He's, he's, you know, swilled he's the Kool-Aid. He's, no... he's a true oh, believer. He's a true believer. He's a true believer. Well, then that, that, you know, we may see that then because it's, it's, and you, I love the way you describe it, right? Because that's exactly what he did. He had, he had the world by the, uh, you know, 
And then he decided to flush all of it down the toilet. And that his persona of who he is for the rest of eternity, people are going to get that, that look on their face. Like they just smelled something bad. Every time somebody says his name, you know, he's gone from somebody that was considered a pretty popular, uh, you know, actor to just, Harvey Weinstein. Yeah. yeah, exactly. All right. A few more here. Monique Smith. Thank you for openly discussing the fed pens. Happy Chick to. Chicken head PK Neely says community corrections officers or what they're called when uh, they roll out of prisons in my state. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Um, Kevin, great interview. Won't other races protect him as long as he pays people don't mess with other people's money is usually a rule. Isn't it? The here's the, uh, Another race probably would uh, would be willing to protect him if the cash was right. But if you start going down that road, now he is an asset that the white boys are not going to be really happy that got stolen by another race. So if they're going to decide that we're going to allow him to stay on this yard and pay tax, he's going to be paying it to a white guy. That Unless they bleed him dry and then sell him off to a different race. But he's an asset. And... Uh, you know, if they allow it, they, they might just say, we're not having this dude. You know, we don't want this guy on this yard. But right. if they allow him, they're going to want that money for themselves, to be sure. Wow. All right. Y'all ain't right, says there are no Scientology gangs in prison. <laughs> yeah, there aren't enough Scientologists <laughs> in the world to, re to generate enough Scientologist convicts to be able to create a Scientologist gang in prison. Do you know what I think is really funny? The, uh, the fact that this may come as a shock to you, but they really hate you. You know, there's some videos out there and some websites. They're not fond of you. And your, uh, your, your, your YouTube channel has what four times the number of people that they have in their church. Right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, exactly. that's, that's too funny. They're really, it's that's true. You're doing, you're doing great work here. Thank you. Thank you. E.G. Johnson, I'm a lawyer. Pacer will allow you to find out just about everything about a person's case. Charges, convictions, every filing. There's no hiding. Yeah. True story. Danger zone. How do they treat those charged with animal abuse if added to their charges? Um, you know, that's funny that uh, normally I, I don't think I would have a way to answer this, but I do actually uh, have a story about that. But it happened. I was waiting to go um, to the feds for uh, the uh, the bank robberies, and uh, there was a guy that that came into the county jail. And I won't get into the graphic uh, stuff behind the. But he had um, he had killed a couple of uh, of dogs, and um, yeah, three guys took him in a cell, and uh, it was uh, he was treated really badly for a uh, for as long as they possibly could until they got caught. I mean, they uh, they beat this dude. You know, if you if you hurt something that the only reason you were able to do it is because you're bigger or you're stronger or, you know, that no one has any respect for that. You know what I mean? You should be uh, like the, the convict code is that, you know, women and, and kids now, you know, you don't do anything uh, bad to women and kids and, and animals would fall directly into that. It's, it's rare that you come across a convict who doesn't have a story about his dog that's on the outside or his, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, they don't take to that, that too kindly. Okay. Eric Robinson, is suicide rate higher in Scientology? Eric, I can't say for sure, um, but uh, I just, I'm going to leave it at that for now. I can't say for sure. Uh, Andy, fabulous. Will the sisters try and pass him around as punishment? That's fine. We've, we've discussed this. Yeah. Um, Mac D, t shirt idea. D equals nc squared oh shit I like <laughs> that. oh my god <laughs> oh that's awesome that's let me write that down awesome. yeah, right now that is great wow oh, bada really bang we got a we got a winner and the last one and An An anonymous former co no one likes so's uh it wouldn't surprise me if danny masterson gets COs that love to work hard and make his life as difficult. Yeah, indeed. All right, the truly last one. Ryan, great chat, Tommy and AA Ron. If it's so easy to know the shot callers at each pen, how does a regular dude like me find find this out so we can know Danny Masterson's? Is there more than one shot caller in a yard or is there a shot caller for each car? There's a, there's a shot caller. There is a main shot caller for the entire yard. So when I oh. was at... Um, like the FCI at, uh, at Victorville, the shot caller for the entire yard was not a white guy. 
we had a very small car there. Um, so the, uh, it was a, um, someone from a Mexican gang that had the entire yard and the guy that has the entire yard, he's the main shot caller, but then each car will have, you know, their, the top of their food chain. It gets a little confusing, but as far as knowing exactly who it is, you know, when bad things happen or they're worried about a riot, they're going to come and grab the shot callers from every car, bring them in a room and sit down with them. Oh, trust and believe they know exactly who, who the shot callers are. There's no, uh, no ambiguity at all. Wow. All right. Truly the last one. Lori plays as a retired LEO it makes my heart swell to see someone with your history has turned his life around and is doing such great work. God bless you. Ah, it's just such a nice thing to say. I really appreciate that. And so with that, let me show everyone one more time. Uh, Tommy's YouTube channel, the life boat at the life boat. Um, can't miss it. Just uh, check it out guys. Subscribe to that one. And, um, Hey, thank you so much for coming on and doing this with me. I really, it has it. been an honor, man. It really has. Uh, like I said, when I, when I first uh, got a hold of you, I really do watch this channel. Like this is, uh, <laughs> I've, I've done deep dives that kept me awake for a really long time because of your content. I really dig your stuff. Well, thanks, man. All right, everyone. Thank you to all of you who watch until the very end. And we'll talk to you soon. Okay, if you want to see my rock and roll songs, click right on this guitar. And if you want to see an, a different one of my videos, uh, then you could click right inside here. If you have subscribed or not, subscribe.